All right, so what we're gonna do in this video is take a look at the new Redshift camera. So it's a lot of the same settings uh, and properties, but they've reorganized things, they've moved things around. They've also added some new things as well. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so here we are already looking at kind of the finished scene here, looking through the new Redshift camera. And ultimately in order to create one of these, what you need to do is go to your render settings, make sure your render is set to Redshift, and then create a new camera. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is actually get out of this camera because some of the settings uh, will get passed along to my new Redshift camera. And you'll notice right away my scene now looks darker. And so that's definitely something um, I was trying to avoid and why I got out of this camera. So I will create a new camera, a new standard camera as they call it. Notice how it's kind of the main uh, or the default option now. And that is a Redshift camera. I can now look through this and just for fun, I will position it to a similar view to what I had um, previously. Uh, now it'll take a little bit uh, of time for my render view here to update though. Um, oh, I guess it would help if I was looking through it. Perfect. So we have a similar view as we had before, but notice how it's significantly darker. And that's actually something that uh, the optical section is dealing with, but we'll come back to that here very shortly. Um, let's start with the object tab because that's where we start to see some of these new changes here. Um, first and foremost, we now have different types. So the um, perspective is going to be your go-to. It's what you're going to use for pretty much every project. However, you can now, um, use other modes that we had before, but also preview them. So you can preview what a fisheye camera would look like. Okay, so you can really see how empty of a room this is. Almost looks like we're looking through like the a people there. Um, you could also do a spherical. So um, if you've ever wanted to create your own HDRI, um, this is definitely um, one way you could go. And obviously I would want to have the lights brighter, make sure I save out as a 32 bit floating point image. But with this, it is a bit easier to make HDRIs because you can preview them along with some of our other um, options. But like I said, perspective is typically the one we'll be using. Uh, we now have our different focal length options as a slider instead of different presets. I do miss the presets because I do think it was handy to just have a general idea of what some of those different focal lengths might be used for. Um, but you can see as we adjust our focal length, uh, it's going to adjust the angle of view for us as well. We can also shift our camera and where this could be useful, I haven't tested it myself quite yet, is if you were trying to do a significantly larger render, um, you could shift the camera potentially and then stitch together multiple renders to create something that has a much larger resolution um, if you know, you're running into an issue trying to render something um, you know, a single image that is significantly larger. Uh, we can also adjust sensor size, really not something we'll probably need to worry about or use too much. You'll see there are some presets here, um, but this could be useful if you were trying to replicate um, some high-end video cameras or some that have a specific sensor size as um, it can make it easier to integrate things into footage um, or just get a similar look to these cameras since, um, you know, we can get something that uh, is gonna be based on them. Um, you can also lock the ratio here. Uh, that way, um, you know, if you want to adjust the size, it's going to do so with the ratio being the same. Um, and you can also adjust the fit, which uh, for something that has a similar kind of 16 by nine-ish ratio, I don't think that's quite what this is, but I, you know, close enough, then kind of how you want this to fit isn't gonna make a big difference. Um, you can see here, um, it can make a little bit of a difference um, depending on what option you choose, but it also is dependent on your sensor size. So I'm gonna undo that just a bit. Okay, so that's really perhaps a bit too far. That's the object tab. You know, really the type of camera, the focal length are the big things and potentially shift as well if you do some high resolution stills. Next up, you have the optical tab. Now this is kind of what's um, perhaps it's not new, but it's um, better integrated. You used to be able to do this in the Redshift render view with some of the um, additional settings um, to work with things perhaps a little bit more photographically. So if you've used a digital SLR before and you're used to working with um, exposure or ISO or um, f-stop, um, those settings affect the overall brightness of an image. And so this isn't exactly a lighting tutorial, though 
Um, perhaps I can do one of those at some point. Um, what we can do here is decide um, how much control we want with these different properties and how much uh, or if they're going to impact the brightness of our image. When it's set to EV, um, the only thing that will change the overall brightness here is the exposure value. Okay, so you can use that to make an image darker, you can use it to make it brighter, and even that is a little bit more photographic light. Okay, um, aperture on the other hand is still just related to depth of field and so won't make uh, really any difference here. Okay, now when you switch this to filmic, notice how ISO now. Uh, becomes available. And so we can use this to dial things in as well. And so if you are familiar with ISO, it's another way you can work with this. And um, you can see now even aperture also has a bit of an impact on the way this image looks. Now, I'm not saying it's the most um, kind of realistic or uh, completely replicates a camera, but it's a good start if that is something you are very familiar with. We also have things like wide point vignetting. Once again, some of these features aren't necessarily new. They're just um, easier to find and you can do them on a per camera basis um, as opposed to have to doing it globally in some of our Redshift um, kind of effect settings, which I'm not really seeing those at the moment. So I'll have to track down those at some point. Um, depth of field, kind of the settings for that have also been changed now. So previously you could do it in the camera tag uh, the Redshift camera tag or in the camera itself. Well, now this is the only place to do it. All right, now uh, what is a bit unfortunate is you still, or you have to turn on bokeh, okay? Without it, depth of field won't work. Notice how now my image is completely blurry. Um, that's because I need to specify a focal distance or a focus distance. And you can still do that using the click to focus in your um, render view here. You can also just click anywhere in your scene once you've clicked on the eyedropper and that will work as well. So once again, I missed the presets. It made it feel like you were working a little bit more photographically, especially if you weren't quite as familiar um, with the settings, but ultimately lower values are gonna give you shallower depth of field, more blurred um, as you get further away from what's in focus, whereas higher values will keep things more in focus. You can also twirl down bokeh now um, to work on the actual bokeh shapes, the little circles you get. And we have the same kind of options to adjust the aspect ratio as well as how spherical um, they are. So similar settings there. Primarily though, you know, depth of field, you still have to turn on bokeh, which I think I'm not a huge fan of that needing to be there. Um, that being turned on, I feel like it should have been up top here and really just depth of field instead of uh, bokeh itself. Okay. So there we go. There is depth of field. There's really only one set of settings now to control um, depth of field. Next up, we have motion blur. What's nice about this is it's now in the camera. Okay. Um, so you can decide whether you want different uh, shutter types, still or movie. Um, I don't think we're really seeing too many of the changes here until we come to override. And even then, yeah, the only thing that's changing is the angle versus time. Um, which that was definitely changing before, I just was missing it. Um, so that can be helpful as well. Uh, you know, what's nice is if you have ever have tried to render a still, getting motion blur can be a bit tricky um, unless you had things actually, you know, animated over a longer period of time. This can make it a little bit easier to control this um, and get something maybe you're more uh, familiar with since you can work with the shutter speed here as opposed to shutter angle. And I know personally, um, shutter speed is what I am more used to. Um, like I said, you can override this so it's per camera or global based on your actual render settings um, and whether or not you want to use uh, camera motion. Okay, next up, color correction. All this stuff was here previously, not too many changes. Um, tone mapping, similar to what you're seeing in the optical section, a little bit with the white point um, in vignetting, but this can be taken further to work with the highlights a little bit more, choose what value you want to, to kind of set to white. Um, same thing with blacks, how, um, what values you want to crush to black. Threshold will contribute to that as well. And lastly, saturation. Honestly though, for this type of tone mapping, I think you're much better off when it comes to 
uh, doing this in post instead of baking this kind of tone mapping into your image. It's why I don't really use LUTs. Um, even though, you know, Grayscale has some, some great ones, you can find some really nice ones on the internet. Same thing with these color controls. I just feel like uh, if I'm gonna do this type of stuff, I wanna do it in After Effects. And that way I'm not kind of stuck with whatever curve um, I work with and add to my beauty image once I render. The lens effects is where you will see bloom, flare, and streak all combined. Personally, I think bloom is the only one worth using um, the majority of the time. I don't have a good example of it here, but if you're trying to get something with emission glow, um, it's nice that you can now override and control this individually. I guess what I could do is turn off um, some of my lights and um, use, perfect. I think I'm gonna have to keep the area light on though or else we'll get rid of all our lights, yeah. So let's just set this area light down to like 0.01 because I'm pretty sure I have emission turned on in here. Let's also hide that plane. All right, so just a little bit of light from that. Let's turn on. The portal light, maybe we'll get just a little bit. Now, that's right, without the sun or sky on, we won't get anything there. Maybe set that to point one. I just want a little bit of illumination here, but uh, so we can see kind of the glow. I guess we can work with that um, in our camera. Um, bloom, uh, the intensity, it's already kind of as high as it needs to go. Um, the threshold is gonna determine what value it's going to add to the glow. So as we start turning this down more, we should start to see some of that glow get added and we can see that. And honestly, this value corresponds to um, the emission value you have in your material. So I think it's this one, base properties. This is a standard material. I'm looking for emission. You can see it's down to 0.3, so not all that high. But as I get closer to it, we are starting to see it kind of show up more in our image. So this is a way you can do glow. Um, what I don't like about this bloom and why I don't use it as much as I used to when say I used octane is there's no way to separate that bloom or let me rephrase that. There's no easy way to separate that bloom until it's uh, into its own pass. Okay. There's no separate AOV for it. You can trick it if you do a couple of different beauty passes, one with bloom, one without, or one with post effects, one without, but ultimately that's a lot more than what I want. Um, to spend doing on this. So let's go ahead and turn this stuff back on. I don't remember exactly what that area light was at, but I think we'll be able to get pretty close. Um, turn on our plane as well. Okay. And yeah, I feel like we lost a little bit of brightness there, but yeah, we're getting, we're pretty close. We're in the ballpark here. So flare and, and streak are going to work similarly. Um, looking for those very bright pixel values that you will get from lights that you'll get from materials that have selfie um, or have emission turned on. Uh, and uh, they can be useful, but um, I'm not a huge fan of them personally. And then lastly, display. Now there is one interesting thing in display that does make it a little bit easier to work with depth of field. And I'm going to stop my render for this here because we can now preview the frustrum, which will show us what is exactly in focus. Um, and let's see if I can just hide our room here to make this a little bit easier to see. And actually that other camera as well, since we don't want to get, um, have that to worry about. So in this camera, you can see um, we have our frustrum um, to show on selection, which we can make a little bit more obvious if we turn on our focus plane. So now we can see exactly what's in focus and exactly where that geometry is, uh, and this can make it a little bit easier to set our focus distance because that's really what we're seeing here. All right, if I come back to my camera, go to the object tab, I lied optical tab, you will see as I change this, I am changing the focus distance. So not only can we see it visually when we render, we can also get a pretty good idea of what's going to be in focus just by using this focus plane. Now, I should also mention, though I haven't quite tested this out yet, that we should be able to preview depth of field in our um, viewport as well by turning on depth of field there. And so we can kind of get a sense of what that looks like. It's not perfect. It would certainly help if I had that um, room back on. But what are you going to do? There it is. Right. So we can preview it a little bit here. This isn't 
you know, maybe as accurate as what we would see in our Redshift render view, but it's definitely better for previewing, say, an animation where um, it can be a little bit tricky to tell what's going to be in focus, what's out of focus, even with um, that focal plane, focus plane um, being turned on. Um, it can still be a little bit tricky. So I think the combination here is really what I um, will use going forward. We still have our same composition options. If you've ever used grid, grids and other overlays, triangles, golden spiral, golden section, that stuff. Um, so all of that um, still can be found here. And I still think these are very useful as well, though not particularly new. So that is a look at the new Redshift camera. As I said, you know, it's really just kind of a reorganization of the majority of things. There are some new things as well. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's really an improvement over what we had previously, and it's now all in one. So that will do it for this video. Um, please let me know if there's something else you would like to see, and take care.